Welcome to another creative workflow video where uh, I share my workflow from initial capture all the way to the final print. Now this image was featured in the last photo journal on my blog and so I thought I'd make uh, a sort of a companion video to give you a little more insight into what I did in Lightroom and uh, maybe share a few more uh, tips and ideas that you can use in your own Lightroom editing and also in making prints if you're doing that as well. So this is the initial capture uh, from the field. I do practice exposing to the right as much as I can when I have the time and when it's suitable to conditions. So by that I mean that in this case I was on a tripod, nothing was moving, I had time to sort of analyze my histogram and make adjustments. And exposing to, exposing to the right is really just a way of optimizing the tones that your camera sensor captures. You can see here that my uh, histogram is contained completely within the dynamic range of my camera and that I've maximized that or pushed it more to the right where the camera sensor is more sensitive, uh, avoiding noise. And that just gives me a richer, uh, more vibrant, more, let's say, malleable file to work with uh, in Lightroom. Now, the first thing I did in Lightroom was to actually crop to the panoramic format. And the reason for that was that as soon as I looked at the image, I, I could recognize what it was that I was attracted to originally. And seeing now, seeing the image now, I could see that there's a lot of extra stuff that I really wasn't paying attention to. So for example, or I shouldn't say paying attention to, but extra stuff that really isn't adding to the image. And perhaps I had an inkling in the field that I would want this to be pan uh, panoramic, but of course I can't do that until I get into Lightroom. But everything happening or everything going on from here down uh, is sort of extra and not really adding to the image. It just adds more clutter, gets busier. And from about this area towards the top, there's just more of the same, it gets more cluttered, uh, busier, and you know the colors are really contained in the central area, or at least these interesting shapes here. So I'm going to hit R for crop, and I usually start, if I'm going to do a panorama, I usually start with a 1-3 aspect ratio, just because it's a starting point. I can always adjust it and modify it later, but I kind of like that panoramic format. Uh, I sort of base my matting and my framing around that as kind of a standard just to sort of make things simpler for me. Again, I'm, I'm open to customizing it to what, whatever f aspect ratio works. The key here is, is that the aspect ratio is what actually works for the composition. I don't impose an aspect ratio simply because, uh, you know, that's my camera's format or what have you. So I'll start with a 1-3 ratio. Again, I could have easily modified this and changed it, but in fact, I, I found that it worked. And so I think I initially started up around here somewhere, and that was certainly an improvement, but I thought there was more in terms of what was happening with those other yellow shapes, especially down here on the left-hand side. So I moved further down, and I think right about there was where I felt best. Now you've got more continuity with the yellow shapes and there's an implicit path here from this area up through here and it's along a diagonal and anytime you can establish a diagonal path through your image or establish some diagonal vector, that's a direction that the viewer's eye will follow, typically that's going to make your composition stronger because it's more dynamic. The other thing is that while I did bring this yellow area here very, very close to the edge, and normally that would be something that would be uncomfortable, uh, because it's repeated and repeated more strongly through the image, those yellow shapes, those leaves, uh, then this doesn't feel quite as out of place. It doesn't attract as much attention to it as it would if it were by itself or if it were many fewer of these yellow leaves. And I kind of like that tension. I kind of like the fact that your eye goes up to that area, but I don't think it pulls you out. I think there's enough strength in the remaining parts of the image to pull you back in. The other thing about making it a panorama is that it really refocuses the attention in terms of the tonality and the rhythm and the motif uh, of the image, which is 
for me, these strong vertical shapes, rectangular shapes that vary in texture, they vary in tonality, they vary in size, they even vary in the spacing between them, but they vary along this very narrow uh, thing, which is the tones are all very similar and their shapes are all very similar. Had I had here trees of different colors, you know, a birch, uh, dark wooded trees, uh, cedar trees, that motif wouldn't be as strong. But because these trees are all very similar uh, in terms of tonality, that helps them to work more together. And in fact, you'll see that's one of the primary reasons why I decided to remove the color was to strengthen, uh, to sort of key in on that motif and make it stronger by taking the color component completely out of it and really making it about the tones and the graphical shapes themselves. Before we get there though, I usually like to at least do basic adjustments to an image before I convert to black and white. Again, this is not in every case, but in many cases, I find that it helps me to at least get the image into the ballpark. This idea of working from the general to the specific is a very useful one that you should think about because it allows you to constantly keep your mind on the big picture and not get lost into small details or minor areas of the image that may work by themselves, but don't actually work within the entire uh, composition. The exposure is fine uh, as captured. I don't feel the need to darken it. I like sort of where the midtones are and the feel of the image. The mids is something that the exposure control is going to uh, allow allow you to sort of fine tune. So I'm, I'm happy where, where that is. The white point and the black point uh, deserve careful consideration in many instances because uh, not every image actually needs an absolute white and an absolute black. I want to maintain that sort of misty, moody feel of the image. And if I take something to absolute white, it makes it very bright, makes the whole overall image very bright. And it also kind of makes this area a little bit flatter than I want it, than, than I want it to be because it's very bright. So let me show you what I mean. If I hold down the Option key and adjust the whites to the actual white point, right about there, back off a little bit. If I let go of the option key now, uh, you see that it almost feels like, or it looks as though there's actually light, more light coming into the scene than there actually was. It, it makes the image a bit too bright for me. I want it to have a little bit more atmosphere, uh, a little more mood. And so I'm going to back off from the whites uh, down to about here. And this is strictly just visual. Now, of course, I'll make a print and the print will be where I actually decide if the white point is, is set correctly or not. But I prefer this here uh, in terms of the white point. And the same thing with the blacks. If I go to if I go to absolute black, uh, I'm, t I'm saying that I want the image to have something that is absolutely black. And in this case, again, I don't think I want that. In fact, I know I don't. Let me show you. If I hold down the option key and pull the black slider down to the absolute black point, Colors are better, it's more vibrant, it's more saturated, but the feel of the image for me is lost. What I want to convey to the viewer is lost. It feels too heavy. It's pushed the trees in the front very much to the front. It's just too stark now. And so again, I'm going to back off on the blacks by taste to about there. And again, that feels much better to me. These trees here in the front don't quite dominate. It keeps a sense of lightness a sense of the mist and the fog in the scene. So there's the before and there's the, and there's the after. Just from those two adjustments, the white point and the black point. Now in order to expand sort of the tonality in the highlights, I'm going to pull down on the highlights adjustment about there. That just gives me a little bit more variation here in these areas uh, that are very bright and I'm going to push up on the shadows or the shadow slider to about there again to sort of open up the image so it doesn't get too bright doesn't get too dark I'm really interested and I like sort of the feel that the image maintains when I kind of maximize within this narrow range meaning the shadows and the highlights not the absolute white or the absolute black so there's before and there's the after. I'm not going to add any clarity 
When I add clarity, I am adding mid-tone contrast. And it helps certain parts of the image, like these trees in the foreground. But I, again, I feel like it takes away from the atmosphere. And I prefer an image that looks more like that, a little softer, a little more uh, moodier, even more painterly, if you will. And so I'm going to leave the clarity at zero. I'm not going to add any. I'm not going to reduce any. I think just where it is uh, at zero without adding any is fine. Now at this stage, in my editing of the image, I really started to notice that uh, notice this motif that I mentioned before of the changing tonality, of the spacing, of this rhythm between these trees. And so by hitting V, I convert to black and white. And once I converted to black and white, I knew that this was the image that I had in mind, or at least it feels much closer to what I wanted to capture, what I wanted to express. Because the color's been removed, but the shapes and the lines and the, this motif is still preserved. Uh, and in fact, I found that the color was actually taking away. I think the leaves stand out. They create sort of this sprinkling of highlights moving from left up to right, and then the trees and their tones, their shapes, their size, their which way they're leaning, the spacing between them becomes much more obvious, obvious and, and much more evocative, I think. Once you convert to black and white, you can access the black and white controls, which are here. And I'm going to turn these on. I have them disabled right now, but I'm going to turn them on to show you uh, well, actually, I thought they were going to come back to where I had them, but they didn't. I guess they were reset once I con uh, converted the image back to color. So let, let's, let me actually show you the adjustments that I made. Uh, you can hit the auto slider, the auto button here, which sort of tries to guesstimate uh, you know, the best settings for them. But the reds here uh, control some of the background. In here, you can see some darkening and lightening of tones. So I'm going to stop about here. Uh, the orange, these are the leaves. And so as I go more to the right, you see they get brighter. To the left, they get darker. And I think I'm going to stop somewhere around here because the leaves are orange and yellow. And so if you see when I adjust yellow, I get a, a different portion of their, uh, their shapes or their, their color. And I'm going to bring that up about here. And I found that between that adjustment of the orange and the yellow, I was able to bring about the most amount of tonal variation and definition in the leaves there. You see the greens here adjusting a little bit of the center of this tree. It may have some moss or something on it. And so I'm going to bring this up about 20, just to give me a little more uh, variation here. Aqua doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, blues don't do a whole lot, so I'll leave those kind of where they were. And the rest don't do anything either because I don't have any purple or magenta in the scene. I'm going to jump down to detail and turn this panel on. And the basic adjustments here are uh, sharpening. I added a fair amount of sharpening. Uh, there's some nice textures and detail in the trees that are closest. Uh, or, or most uh, forward in the scene. I used a rather low radius, again, to make sure that I'm sharpening uh, the smallest edges in these trees. Uh, I pushed up the detail slider a bit to, again, enhance that sharpening along those edges. And then the most important uh, sharpening adjustment, in my opinion, the masking. And I really want to mask out uh, the background, the foggy areas, and just keep that sharpening on the areas that can use it or need it the most, which are, again, those trees that are in the foreground. Uh, noise reduction, pretty standard. Luminosity, 20, and color, 20. ISO 400, the image isn't very noisy at all, so I just add uh, a, a, you know, a, a fair amount to make sure that I'm get, getting rid of any, any noise, but not enough to compromise the detail on the image. Now, at this point, I felt that the image needed a bit more uh, presence, if you will, and I didn't want to add clarity for that. So I came into the tone curve. I'm going to turn this on. And with the tone curve, I added uh, a strong contrast curve, which gave me 
the contrast I was looking for without eliminating, again, the feel of the image that would have happened had I set a really uh, absolute black and an absolute white. So this is the before, and that's the after. Uh, many have asked me when I decided to use the tone curve versus the contrast slider here. And there are two, two answers to that. One, I use the tone curve when I want to have a lot more control over the actual contrast, contrast itself. And the other answer is that sometimes I'll try both and see which one gives me the better result. In this case, I was pretty sure that I wanted something a little bit more aggressive, which typically you get when you use the tone curve. And I also wanted to be able to make adjustments if need be. Now, the last piece uh, of the editing here is dodging and burning, which is something that I am a big proponent of because I think it really helps to bring an image to life, to add that extra bit of uh, depth and dimension to an image. Uh, because, again, we are capturing something that we see with our eyes uh, with a camera that's a single lens, and it tends to always flatten things out. And I think that dodging and burning is one of the best tools that you can use to give your images a sense of life. By life, I mean how the light is working within the scene to make everything look dimensional. So I'm going to turn on this adjustment brush. And I basically added a, a slight amount of darkening or burning, minus 0 0.30. That's kind of a, a third of a stop. But I also applied it uh, with varying amounts of flow. And flow is basically the opacity. So you can see here, I'm going to press O to keep the mask enabled. You can see that here and along these edges here, here, I'm applying it at 100% flow. But in some other areas, I'm applying it at 50% flow. And you can see that because the red mask is a little bit lighter, uh, where it's darker, that usually means, or it means that I've applied it stronger. And again, what I'm doing here is just adding a little bit of shaping to these trees on the, along the right-hand side, darkening some areas that, that are already a little darker so that they just have a little more roundness to them. And again, it just improves this sense of dimension in the image. So turn that off. So again, this is before the adjustment, and that's after the adjustment. The last adjustment that I added uh, was split toning. I'm going to turn that on here. And I added the split toning, uh, again, to see if it would give me a little bit more, more mood. And what I did was I added a bit of a bluish tone and that's about 220 in the hue adjustment and saturation 11. So I'm adding a little bit of cool toning to the highlights to just make the fog a little bit more mysterious, if you will. So again, this is without it. And that's with it. And I was hoping that this would also complement uh, the print. I'm thinking of a nice uh, matte paper that in by nature isn't as white as a photographic paper, so it tends to be a little bit subdued in terms of its whiteness, and with the cooling of the image itself, that would create a nice um, counterbalance between the shadows, which are neutral, and the highlights, which, again, just have that little bit of cooling. So the before, or the original, post-crop, and then the after.